Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday or Wednesday night. This isn't this is Wednesday night, but it's not a Wednesday night Bible study. It's just our weekly Bible study. Uh, this has been a big day. We celebrated <laughs> birthdays and um, did axe throwing. It's been a big day. Busy week, busy week. But we are on our second lesson in Job. Uh, not in chapter 2 by any means. We skipped 13 chapters to go to chapter 14 this week. So um, let's pray and just get started. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and your grace and your mercy. Father, thank you that you are Lord of all. Thank you that even though life seems to just overwhelm us, that you never leave us alone, that you're always by our side. No matter what trouble we find ourselves in and no matter how many blessings we find ourselves in, Lord, you are always by our side. Help us to worship you the way you want us to worship you. Help us to serve you, Lord, in a way that others see you through us. Father, I just beg that you would help our country. Father, that you would help us to believers, Lord. Help us to come to you and humble ourselves and do your will, Father, and that you will, through us, help this land of ours that seems to have gone so awry to come to you. Lord, I pray this so much. I pray that you would bless your church throughout the world, Father, that believers would be turning to you and that churches would be lifting you up so that you can draw all men to you. Father, forgive us where we fail you. Give us the energy, the desire, the drive to do what it is that you want us to do. Help us to see clearly what you want us to do. And then, Father, help us just not to be able not to do it, that we want to serve you. Father, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to, at uh, warp speed, catch you up on 13 chapters. Um we left last week where Job had bargained with God and God actually gave him permission to do anything that he wanted, that Satan could do anything he wanted to with Job's possessions, even his children. And so he just wiped him out. Well, that didn't work. Job still praised God and still worshiped God. And so this week, Satan goes back before God, back before the Lord, and he says, eh, he still has his health. If you just take his health away from him, he'll he'll curse you to your face. And God said, well, we'll take that challenge. Just you, I give you control over his health, over his life, but you cannot take his life. And so Satan went about to make Job as miserable as he could. And so he, he caused Job to be covered in sores from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. He was just covered in these sores, maybe boils or something like that. The scripture says that he literally took stone or pottery and scraped his sores. He, he was in agony, in absolute agony. And at this point, his wife even turned against him. His wife said, why don't you, why do you hang on to this, this integrity, this um, thinking that you're guiltless? Why don't you just go ahead and curse God and die and get out of your misery? And Job basically says, you're talking foolishly, woman. That's, that's no way to talk. I am not guilty, and I will not curse God. And, and it says that even in all of this, in everything that Job said, he still did not sin against God. And then his, his friends arrive on the scene. He has three friends. Um, his first friend is Eliphaz, the Temanite. And basically, he, um, he, he tells Job, he, and they, they have good intentions. I, I honestly believe they do. They, they sat there with Job for seven days, and they didn't speak. And finally, Job actually speaks. And, um, but um, the friends arrive, and, and Job actually speaks first. And he says, cursed is the day I was born. I just wish I'd never been born. If I hadn't been born or if I'd been stillborn, at least I would be at rest in the grave. And instead, I'm in misery. 
I am in misery. And so the first friend, the Temanite, he basically says, you know, you've taught others and you have supported many and now you have trouble. Now you've got trouble and um, you're discouraged. And, you know, we can see that already in Job. And then he says, but when did you ever see uh, this, you know, this kind of trouble come on a, on a just man, on an upright man? And, and he even goes on, I think he's the one that says, um, if the man who plows evil and plows trouble, that's what he reaps. And so he's really trying to convince Job that, um, that he's done something wrong. He's done something that mispleased God. And I think I said this last week. The, the concept of that day was that if you had really bad things happen to you, that you had done something bad enough to really anger God and to bring his wrath down on you. And so this, this, this Timonite friend, he goes on to say, you know, God performs miracles and he uh, blesses the men that he corrects. And he just kind of goes on. And this is all very poetic and all very long and drawn out with all of these metaphors and similes and things like that. And, but he, he basically says, in one place there, he says, don't despise the discipline of the Lord. Uh, those he injures, he heals, but he still goes back to that concept of you must have done something really bad to get God's wrath to come on you this bad. And so Job responds to friend number one. And um, he says, you know, only if I could just weigh my anguish so you could understand, literally put it on a scale and weigh it so that everyone could understand how much I'm going through and how much, you know, it's like God's arrows are in me and I'm crying out. And um, he says, um, a despairing man should have um, the devotion of his friends. And he says, but my friends are undependable. And you're like an intermittent stream. They use all of these natural uh, things to refer to. He says, you're like an intermittent stream and you're no help to me. You're no help to me at all. Um, if you think I've been wrong, if you think I've done something so wrong, tell me what it is so that I can answer you. Um, and he says, but I'll not be silent. I will speak out in my anguish. And then, um, the second friend, Bildad, the Shuite comes along and he basically says, how long are you going to keep saying these things? Does God not, is God not just? Does he pervert justice? He says, he says, you know, your children sinned and they paid the penalty of that sin, referring to Job's children who were all killed in that one incident. And um, if you're pure and upright, won't God act on your behalf, he says. And so he says, God doesn't reject the blameless. Well, Job gets enough of him. And I, like I said, I think they had good intentions. I think they wanted Job to search his life and find what he could have done that was so horrible that brought this wrath of God on him and take care of business and, and get out from under this misery. And Job goes, you know, I know, I know all these things, but, um, and who can, who can, uh, go up against God and come out unscathed? No one can. He moves mountains. He performs wonders. How can I dispute with him? I can only plead my case and ask for mercy. And then he goes on, um, he's, Job says he destroys uh, the blameless and the wicked. Remember back when he responded, um, uh, I believe it was actually when he responded to maybe his wife, and he, or, or last week maybe, he says, can we take the good from God, but then not take the bad? And so that's kind of what he's saying here. He, God, he says, God destroys the blameless and the wicked. Sometimes he just does that. He says, I wish I had an arbitrator that I could go before God and, and could speak without fear, you know, with this arbitrator. And he said, I, I would do that. But, um, but anyway, he goes on to say, and, and I'll say that um, I, I, think, I don't think these charges against me are because of, of my sin. Um, and he goes on to say, does God see with mortal eyes like we do? No, he doesn't. Um, but, um, and, he, and he says, God knows I'm not guilty. And, and there's no one that can rescue me. 
because God knows I'm not guilty, but I'm still going through this. And then the third friend, uh, Zophar, the uh, Manathite. Um, and he, he says to Job, he says, you, you, are you just going to keep on saying that you believe you're flawless, that you, you think you haven't sinned, and will no one rebuke you? You're mocking God when you say this. And how I wish God would just speak to you and, and just open up to you and tell you what, what you've done wrong because you've evidently done something. So put away the sin, whatever it is, so that you can, you can get out from under this, this evil thing. And uh, you'll surely uh, you'll surely forget your trouble if you'll do that, he says. Um, but the eyes of the wicked will fail, and hope will be a dying gasp. So he's saying you've got to have done something because you are failing, and it's the it's the eyes of the wicked that fail, and the there's no hope for them. Their their hope is just a dying gasp if they're wicked, and you must be wicked. You must have done something sinful to bring this on you. And so Job has pretty much had it at this point. And he says, doubtly, doubtless, and he's being sarcastic. He says, doubtless, you are just full of wisdom. And he says, and when, and when you die, wisdom will just die because you got it all evidently. And he says, I want you to know I have a mind and I am not inferior to you. And even though I am blameless, I'm a laughing stock to you. I'm just a laughing stock to you. And he says, God is life and he is breath of all mankind. He is wisdom and power. The deceived and the deceiver are his. So Job still, even after, and this is, this has been 13 chapters and, and they do these very lengthy, um, Oh, I mean, I want to just read an example. My days are swifter than a runner. They fly without a glimpse of joy. They skim past like boats of papyrus, like eagles swooping down on their prey. And that's the type of language that's used in Job. And, you know, I thought to myself, how in the world he is in all this pain and suffering? How in the world did he take the time to even speak like that? But that is what's recorded for us in the book of Job. Um, and then Job goes on to say, he says, I really would like to just speak to God because you're just smearing me. You're just smearing me with lies. And you are like worthless physicians to me. If you would just be silent, that would be your wisdom. So Job is really putting his his friends, as we're going to call them. Oh, and then he says, how, how would you fare if God examined you? You're here judging me. How would you fare if God examined you? And then I want to read verses thir um, chapter 13, verses 14 through 18. Why do I put myself in jeopardy and take my life in my hands? Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. Indeed, this will turn out for my deliverance. For no godless man would dare come before him. I know I will be vindicated. So Job has not given up hope in the Lord. And that's what brings us to today's lesson. Job has taken us on this poetic journey through his suffering, through dealing with his well-meaning friends that have made him deeper into despair. Um, Job knew that he did not understand everything around him. We, can, we learn from Job that we certainly do not know everything that goes on in the universe, but um, his friends failed miserably at helping him. And he said, you're as worthless as bad physicians and your silence would be wisdom. And so Job himself knew that he was innocent and he believed that he would be vindicated by his holy God. And so that brings us to today's lesson. This, this particular scripture to me was a little odd that that's what they used to teach next in this series, but we're gonna go with it. Um, I've kind of done the best I can, and now I'm going to kind of fly through the rest of this. We uh, start in verse uh, in chapter 14 with verses 1 and 2. 
Man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. Um, Job, again, very poetic in the way he states things, but he's saying we're born of woman. And at best, even if we live a long life, it's short in the scheme of things. And he, he's still maintaining his, his innocence, but he's, he's, he's growing deeper in despair that we can see. And he says, our life is just like a flower. It's here one day and gone the next. The brevity of life, I think, is what he's really, uh, is, is just really emphasizing here. He says, it's like a flower that's going to be here one day and gone the next, or like a shadow that flees. And he, he says, we're all of trouble. We're going to have stress. We're going to have fear. We're going to have pain. We're going to have health problems. We're going to have sorrow, sickness, suffering. We are going to have it. It's part of life. It's a part of this brief life that we have. And in some sections, we see that Job is uh, wishes to be dead. And then in other sections, we see where he, he takes hope in, in his God. Um, we see how human Job was, and that he was not exempt, certainly, from despair. And so the next verses, three through six, um, Job tells us that he believes that God is sovereign and that he is in control. Verses three through six, and doth thou open thine eyes upon such a one, and bringest me into judgment with thee? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean, not one? Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. Turn from him that he may rest till he shall accomplish as in hireling his day. He is, he is saying, God, you are sovereign. God is sovereign. We cannot add a day to our lives. God has set our boundaries. He knows our months. He knows our days. He has set our boundaries, and we cannot change that. It cannot be changed. And then he, um, Job wonders why God would even uh, pay attention to him. He is very insignificant. Um, and dost thou open thine eyes upon such an one? He says, why do you even look on me? I am so insignificant in the scheme of your universe, God. Why do you even consider me? Why do you even look on me? I'm unimportant in your vast realm. Um, but he, he goes back to that thought that God is in control. And then he says, um, until we, we go to our rest, that we accomplish our rest as a hireling his day. He's referring to, you know, where you've hired someone and they work all day and they're finally finished and they get their pay. Um, and at times Job treats the grave as a reward, like the grave would be a reward from the suffering that I'm doing right now. And so now we go on, um, to, um, verses seven through 12. And it says, for there is hope of a tree. If it be cut down, that it will sprout again and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stalk thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. But man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? As the waters fail from the sea, and the flood decayeth and drieth up, no man lieth down and riseth not, till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. He is in deep despair when he evidently when he writes this and, and still waxing poetic with the way he talks about it by talking about the tree and even though it's cut down that it, it can re-sprout again. It gets the smell of water and that old that old trunk and we know, have you ever cut down a tree and then all of a sudden all these sprouts began uh, to come out around it? And, and it does happen. And, and Job is saying, but man is not like that. When man lays down to die, he's dead. It's over. So we don't really understand. Job doesn't give us much of a glimpse 
of his understanding of eternity. We, I, I think I emphasized last week, we don't know when this book was written. We don't know what, um, what era it was written in. Like I said, if you do a chronological Bible, the one I did, did it right after Genesis. But um, some think it was much later than that. But we don't really get a good glimpse, I don't think, of Job's concept of eternity. Because here in his despair, he is saying, you know, the tree may re-sprout, but man does not. And we don't re-sprout on this earth. And there was a phrase here, so man lieth down and riseth not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. It was kind of hard for me to really understand. So man lays down until the heavens are no more. Um, I don't know. One of the things I thought was kind of interesting in this lesson, in, in the commentary of this lesson, they said that is quite possibly where we get the modern expression until hell freezes over. Like nothing's going to happen, like so-and-so isn't going to happen until hell freezes over. And so man layeth down and riseth not until the heavens be no more. Um, we have the benefit of the New Testament. We have the benefit, evidently, of much more uh, scripture, maybe, than Job had. Um, we know for sure Job was definitely prior to Ezekiel because Ezekiel is the first one who mentioned him. So Job is in his despair, and he is talking about how death comes to man, and it does, and we have to face that, that death comes to man no matter what. And But I'm just so thankful that we have Christ that we have the life of Christ, that we have the, the teachings of Christ to teach us that we don't just lay down to rise no more. We go from here to the presence of God because Christ died on that cross and he arose three days later. And that gave us the proof. And he says, I've, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that you can come be with me that you're going to arise the same way I did. Just like he told the thief on the cross, today, today you are going to be with me in paradise. I don't know what Job knew about eternity, what Job believed about eternity. We, we only see these glimpses of his despair and his, his coming to grips with the mortality of man, I think. Uh, and it's, it's depressing. It was depressing to Job to be seemingly locked into this misery and this suffering. These next few verses, we get a little bit of a glimpse, maybe. But from those verses I read you, and I'm going to go back to those in just a minute, those 14 through 18 of chapter 13, he had belief that he was going to be vindicated, that God was going to take care of him. But listen to the verses 13 and 14. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me in secret until thy wrath be past, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. If man, if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. You know, it's almost hard to understand there. Does he think he is going to have a transformation? My change will come? Or is he talking about the change of his suffering that will die when he goes to the grave? I don't know. I don't know. Um, the commentary didn't give a whole lot of insight into that. But it almost seems like he has this glimpse of when my days are my appointed days, um, all the days of, of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Um, I don't know. I'm not for sure, but it gives us a little bit of a view on, on Job's view of eternity, I think. As believers, we have that hope, though. We, um, we have the hope in Christ that God became man to come and to die for us and to deliver us from this life that, like Job says, is vanishing. It's just vanishing, and yet we know that we have a deliverer from it. 
that suffering and pain and stress and fear can grip us in this life, but that our deliverer will take us from this life to a life with him in God's presence where pain and sorrow and fear and suffering have no power, have no authority there. So we cling to those promises. We cling to that hope where maybe Job didn't have quite that kind of hope, but he still had hope in his God. And I want to read to you one more time those verses 14 through 18. Why do I put myself in jeopardy and take life, my life in my hands, though he may slay me? Though he may slay me, will I yet hope in him? I will surely defend my ways to his face. Indeed, this will turn out for my deliverance. For no godless man would dare come before him. I know I will be vindicated. When we have God in our lives, even in Job's state of despair, he knew that he would be vindicated. He knew that he had not done this horrible thing. Even though he didn't know the conversation between God and Satan, where God called him an upright man twice. He fears God. He's upright. He's blameless. Yet Job didn't know that. But he still clung to his hope in God. So let me kind of just wrap some of this up. First, I want to talk about the friends. You know, we need to be careful as friends. When we go to someone who's suffering, someone who's going through something, we need to be careful. I think these friends had good intentions. I really think they had good intentions. They were sincere, but they were sincerely wrong. And they were no comfort to Job. They actually drove him deeper into despair and had to defend everything. I think we need to understand that as Christians, we are not exempt from pain and suffering, depression, despair. You know, when someone gets depressed that's a Christian, I've heard other Christians say, well, Christians aren't supposed to get depressed because we have all of this. And maybe that's true, but we do. We go through times of despair and distress. Some do, for sure. And you know, God is there with us. There was a there was a quote, and I'm going to end with that quote in just a minute, that I think kind of explains that. So we need to be true friends. We need to realize that we are not exempt as Christians. We are not exempt from pain and suffering and fear and sickness and sorrow. We are not exempt from it in this life. So we have the advantage of knowing Christ and knowing the hope that he brought. But when we find ourselves in a situation like Job did, or even just a partial situation like Job did, very few of us find us, self that, find us in that deep of suffering and misery where everything has been robbed from us and our health. I think the message is that God does not always deliver us from despair but he delivers us through it. He never leaves us alone. We may turn our back on God, but God never turns our back on us. So even though he may not deliver us from all of the pain that can come through our lives, he delivers us through it. And so like Job, we've got to make up our mind, make up our heart, not to blame God, just to call on his mercy and trust that he will deliver us through it, just like Job did. Thank you.